A system to change levels. Now, you know, quite a number of you over here, I'm sure when we start praying in the church for a, a you know, one minute, two minutes, okay, but as you go 10 minutes, you become very uncomfortable. I know that. You say, when will pastor say amen and move on to some other part of the service? You're not comfortable. Why? Because you haven't made that a practice in life. You don't apply it because you don't see value in it. When you see value in something, you will go for it. But most Christians don't see value in prayer. Why? The reason is because they have not experienced the power there is involved in prayer. Simple. They pray, but they don't see results. They pray because they have to pray. They pray because they think, if I don't pray, God will punish me. And things may not go right. So the, 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 you know, the, the reason, the motive behind is not right. But if you really believe prayer works, even if you don't have time, you will make time. Even if you don't have time, you will make time. And I'm trying to impress upon you, people of God, the days are not getting better, they're getting worse. And if you don't know how to pray, you're in deep trouble. Because prayer is the system by which you connect with God so that His life, His power, His wisdom will flow through you. Because when you're faced with a challenge that you cannot address, you don't have answers to, and nobody around you and nobody in your acquaintance can help you, the only person that can help you is God. But if you do not know how to connect with Him and how to access Him and how to pull down the resources, you will be in deep trouble. When they were in deep trouble and they were about to die, Three kings. Kings with their armies. They marched for a week. They said they found out. They realized we don't have any water now. Not only are our cattle and our, our horses and all of them going to die, but we're going to die too. Not because the enemy is going to kill us. The climate is going to kill us. There's no water. So what did they say? They call on a what? A prophet. Why do they call on a prophet? Because he's the only one who knows how to access. You with me? But today the Bible calls us priests and kings. A priest is supposed to access God's presence. Access the wisdom of God. Access the power of God. The New Testament prophet is different to the Old Testament prophet. Because in the New Testament, everyone has received the Spirit of God that's born again. Especially if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you are now having greater access to the things of God. So, what is the basic difference between the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet is, a New Testament prophet is one that confirms what God has already revealed to his children. Whereas in the Old Testament, the prophet gave direction and the people followed the direction whether they had a confirmation or not because that was the way God operated in the Old Covenant. But today we're in a different covenant where every one of you has the Spirit of God in you. Say amen if you're born again. Now, when a prophecy is given, if that prophecy does not line up with what God has already spoken to you, two things. One, you don't throw it away. You put it on the shelf and wait to see if there is a time that God will confirm that. If there is no confirmation, you're not in any way obligated to comply with that. So this is important for you to understand. So they call upon the prophet for what? The prophet says, I need to connect. So what does he say? Let's get some worship. Call somebody that can play an instrument. Why? He wants to connect in the spirit. Prayer is the means to connect. You cannot be negligent in your prayer life and expect to be successful in the eyes of God 
in a way that people will say, there's something different about this man. If you become prosperous, if you become wealthy, if you become successful through cheating, through malpractice, from evil ways and evil means, nobody will want to know from you how you did it. But if you did it in a way that the world is baffled, they'll say, there's something different about this person. I want to know. And I'm telling you, the days are coming. I, I, you know, it may not be, thus said the Lord, that I'm not saying that, but I'm telling you, the days are coming, it's going to be very difficult. The days are coming when you will be challenged, please listen carefully, to compromise your faith, to be successful, to even survive, you will have to compromise your faith. Are you ready? How will you face these situations? Are you ready? How strong is your prayer life? The one thing that the devil fights in a believer's life is his relationship with God. If he can disconnect you in your relationship with God, he doesn't have to do anything more. Things will automatically begin to happen. So what should I do? I need to contend with that. How? By intentionally spending time in the Word and in prayer. They become a priority in my life beyond eating. Hello? You know how we make time to eat? Make time to pray. You know how we make time to fellowship around the TV? Make time to read the Bible. Come on. Listen, life is not entertainment. Life is a battle. But most of the time we're trying to make life an entertainment. That's why we want the idiot box all the time in our, in our face. What matters who wins the match? Are you winning in life? That's the question. You celebrate the victory of somebody. Who is going to celebrate your victory? When will they look to you? You know the names of those great cricket players, not just in India, from all over the world you know those names. How many know your name for your victories? I'm not talking about a cricket match, I'm talking about life. Do they talk about you and say, this man is successful. This man overcame this situation. This man overcame this problem in his life. This man knew how to pray and cause his marriage to become fruitful. Their marriage was on the rocks, but you know what? This man knew what to do because he was a man of prayer and God healed that situation in that marriage. How many talk about you? Listen, you are designed to win in life. The Bible tells me that now Christ lives inside me and you. That means we have the DNA of God. Show me God in one place, anywhere, from the beginning until now, where God lost in any situation. If God cannot lose, how dare you say you can lose? How can you say you're a loser when God is a winner? When I have the DNA of my God, how can I be losing? I may go through a phase because I've disconnected or I've not really known, understood how to connect and let his life flow through me. As a result, I might have gone through some ups and downs. But as I begin to connect with God in the word and in prayer, I'm supposed to be living a victorious life. Victory is first experienced on the inside before you experience it on the outside. You know, sometimes people don't understand victory. Because we have different ideas and different definitions of words. Paul was in prison. 
And they thought that was the end of Paul. But it was in, in the prison he wrote letters that are impacting the world even today. Talk to me, somebody. How do you call that loss? How do you call that a defeat? And in the prison, while he was in prison and the people around rejoiced, even Christians rejoiced. I'm not talking about the heathen. I'm talking about the Christians because those people believed in salvation not only through Christ but also circumcision to be added to it. They rejoiced that Paul was in prison. But in the prison, Paul wrote, Rejoice, and again I say, I don't see that as a tone of defeat. No. No. It was a tone of victory. We are supposed to live a victorious life. My friend, please do not be negligent about your prayer life. Time it, change it, make it grow stronger, and spend more time in prayer. Because as you spend time in prayer... You have to understand, it's a system. Prayer is a system by which God enables you to change levels. You know, um, it's an authorized system of communion and fellowship with Him. We talked about what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. He said, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost be with you all. That means a fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We need to become more and more conscious of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We have to learn to live with the awareness of his presence with us at all times. Not just in your prayer closet, but also in your cubicle in your office. Or on the street, or in the restaurant, wherever you are, you need to become more and more aware of the Spirit of God in you and with you. Say amen. We said koinonia means fellowship, association, community, communion, joint participation, and intercourse. All these are involved in the word fellowship. It's very intimate. The word is a very intimate word. It connotes intimacy. Okay? Fellowship and intimacy. Now we said prayer is how power is transformed, transferred. And it is, it is a system of spiritual intimacy. Okay? Spiritual system of in intimacy. It's a place of exchange. We talked about that as well last time. We talked about Jesus. Now, we said after Jesus came out of the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him. The Father declared, this is my, my beloved son in, in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Bible tells us he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And Luke chapter 4 verse 14 says, after the 40 days and 40 nights of prayer and fasting and overcoming temptation, the Bible says, Jesus returned. Chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Hallelujah. Prayer is a place of transference of power. Glory be to God. So don't stop praying until you begin to experience the power transfer. Say amen. So again, we're not talking about the prayer of requests, prayer of supplications today. We're talking about prayer that changes level, that helps you to change levels. And we're talking about prayer that transfers power. So we're talking about power being transferred through prayer. Even today, we said Jesus is sitting on the right-hand side of God and makes intercession for the saints. Why? Although he's sitting on the right-hand side, because Prayer is a system. It's not, it, it, does, it has nothing to do with proximity. He's right by the side of the Father, but that didn't stop him from praying because prayer is the system by which power is transferred. Say amen. amen. So God is, Jesus is continuously praying for all of us. Amen. amen. See, just giving a speech, giving a message is not that difficult because you, you, as I said last time, you can be trained to speak. You can go to school and they will train you. There, there are workshops that they will train you how to speak, how to, uh, you know, um, how to control your voice and how to make the, uh, the, the, they'll teach you in body language. So you can become an ex expert on that. But that does not bring transformation. Glory to God. See, 
communicating life. That's what I'm trying to do. And I'm praying that God will use me as an instrument to communicate life. Communicating life is a direct product of your altar. How strong is your altar? How much on fire is the altar? Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. See, in the days of Elijah, this, the, the, the prophets of Baal built an altar for their God. And they cried and they danced and they sang and they did everything from morning until evening. But they, nothing happened because it was an altar. But the altar made no difference. But the altar that Elijah prepared, glory to God, was a different altar. And then when he called upon God in the, that time of evening sacrifice, the Bible says, he called upon the Lord and the fire showed up. That's what we want. Fire to show up on your altar. So if your prayer life is not strong, you do not have that relationship, intimacy with. Look at the confidence. I want you to observe the, the confidence that Elijah had. The confidence. He said, I'm going to call upon my God. We're going to prove today who the real God is. How can you grow in such confidence if you don't have an intimate prayer and fellowship time with God? How can you grow in such confidence if you don't know how to hear the voice of God? You don't know the word of God, the voice of God. How can you grow in such confidence? And I'm telling you, my people, listen to me carefully. The days are coming where you will have to come to a place where you can hear the voice of God, discern the voice of God, know the leading of the Holy Spirit, or else you're going to suffer like everybody else in the world. It is vitally important for us to develop a strong spiritual connection with God. No longer will it be sufficient for us just to attend church. No longer will it be sufficient for us just to listen to Christian music all day. I'm talking to somebody. People think, well, we're spiritual because we don't pray any other, any other romantic songs. We only pray Christian songs. So, I know people that play romantic songs that are more spiritual than people who play spiritual songs. I'm not kidding. Places, romance is a place in its marriage, right? God is not saying cut off everything. So, nothing wrong. I don't want us to get there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make a point over here that don't try to convince your mind. Don't try to convince your mind. Oh, I'm spiritual. No, your spirituality has to show forth in such a way that you don't boast about it. You don't talk about it, but others talk about you. Jesus never went around saying, oh, look at me, who am I? John said, John the Baptist, he pointed his finger and said, that's the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of mankind. People have to talk about you. That you're a man of God. That you know how to pray. You know how to receive answers from God. You know how to connect with God so that even though there is famine in the land, that famine has no right to touch you. Even though there is calamity around, it, around your life on all around where you live, it cannot touch you or any of your family members. There may be another pandemic, but don't you fear, God is with us. Hallelujah. Just because you're a Christian does not protect you. It's not a vaccine against the enemy. The entire nation of Israel was walking through the wilderness. When God was angry, thousands died. Who? God's people. Who? Abraham's children. But there were others who did not die. Why? Because their hearts were right before the Lord. Don't say, I belong to this church, so I'll be fine. No. It's all based on your personal relationship with God, not on based on a denomination or a church. Amen. Glory be to God. They all boasted, we are the sons of Abraham. And the Bible says, don't talk too much. God can raise the children of Abraham out of a stone. No, no, no. It's your relationship. 
How strong is it? How strong is your prayer life? That's important. Let me tell you. The reason many of us struggle in this prayer walk with God is because your body hates it. Your flesh does not like to pray. But that's when you got to tell yourself, this flesh is like a dog. I got to make it work. I got to order it around. This flesh cannot dominate and dictate to me. This flesh, the Bible says, crucify the flesh. Buffet the body. Because if the body or the flesh is taking preeminence, that means your spirit is taking second place in life. And when your, your spirit man does not have priority, you will be in deep trouble. Please understand that. I challenge you. Increase your prayer life. To the point where you can begin to discern and know things in the realm of the Spirit in line with God's Word. It's not enough just to time yourself one hour, two hours. That's good because your flesh needs to be disciplined. You have to start that way. But don't be satisfied. Uh, you know, it was, uh, as the service started this morning... Uh, and I was in the room getting ready. I flipped through some of the chat that was going on very quickly. And there was a lady, I think it was a lady, somebody from somewhere around the world. They said, I'm looking forward and I'm really blessed. I've already prayed for six hours. Ah, I said, my God, I'm, I'm so glad that this word is working in somebody's life. They got ready praying for six hours. Maybe they're not from this country. That's why they were able to pray, I guess, for six hours before we started this morning. But who knows, somebody must have started in the middle of the night, you know. Uh, don't, you know, I know we can laugh, but then it's a serious matter. That's what I'm trying to say. So communicating life is a direct product of your altar. We must pray without ceasing if you are serious about being used by God and fulfilling destiny. Do you know you're a man and a woman of destiny? And you cannot fulfill destiny in your own strength and in your own power? Glory be to God. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Now, the prayer is a place of transfiguration. Let's go to Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Now, listen to me. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the Word of God. Is that true? Come on, talk to me. The book of Revelation tells us that Jesus is the Word of God. Now, if Jesus is the Word of God, and He used the Word to overcome the devil, is that true? When the devil came, why did they have to pray so much? Think about that. The Word of God had to pray. Because it's the Holy Spirit that inspires the Word. That gives you the Word in season. The sword, the, the arsenal, you know, when the military goes to war, they're not given just one piece of equipment. They have several pieces of equipment that they go with, right? Maybe rifles, maybe guns, maybe, uh, you know, um, hand grenades and all kinds of stuff. And new technology now with all stuff they're going. They go there with all that stuff. And they know, according to the situation, They've been trained to recognize what equipment must be used. Correct? So also, as we read the Bible, don't think reading the Bible in itself is enough. We have to read the Bible because that's our equipment. But now as we pray in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit tells us, hey, this is it. While I'm saying that, let me also say this. It's not, maybe not connected, but I want to mention this. Please make sure when you read, the whole Bible is important. Let me say this. The whole Bible is important. And we need to read the entire Bible. But in the days of, in the old days, the, uh, I mean, in the Jewish culture, the children were raised to memorize the first five books the Pentateuch, right? Five books. Extremely important. 
And if you observe carefully, how did Jesus overcome? He used the scripture from the first five books. Don't be negligent. Don't say Old Testament does not apply. No, 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 no. That's a lie of the devil. Because it's very powerful. You must read the New Testament, but please do not neglect the Old Testament. The New Testament, but the way you understand the Old Testament is in the light of the New Testament. Because Jesus Christ is perfect theology. Don't try to understand God outside of Jesus. If you want to understand God, understand Jesus. Because Jesus is the replica. Exact image. Amen? So don't try to interpret like, if you only read the Old Testament, you'll say, my God, God is a very cruel God. How can he tell people to kill all the entire nation, including babies? Stop. How much do you know to judge God? What do you know? Why did he say that? Because the seed was corrupted with the Nephilim blood. Did you know that? And that was corrupting the entire human race. And if God did not do that, the entire human race would be doomed. Now that we understand now. But if you understand, if you want to know the heart of God, the heartbeat of God, is God a God who is cruel or is he a loving God? Understand Jesus. The Bible tells me in the New Testament, it doesn't say Jesus loved. It says, God so loved the world. It doesn't say Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his son that we should not perish if we believe in him. Is that true? So when you read the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, please do not read it excluding the New Testament if you truly want to understand the character of God. And sometimes you won't understand a lot of stuff, especially when you read the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and those guys. You want to understand because most of the prophetic words were spoken over Israel. And when we don't have the context of the nation of Israel and the history, it sometimes becomes very difficult to understand. That's why you need to go to Bible school. To get to make you understand the context in which God is speaking. But that doesn't mean it only applies to them. It applies to the children of God. That's why it's important to understand that. It doesn't mean because we don't understand, we don't need to read it. No, you need to understand that. You need to read it, understand it, and know how it applies to the church today. I had to divulge a little bit to let you know that it's important to read the Bible, but then understand this. Jesus, who is the Word of God, prayed. It came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up where? Into the mountain to do what? Not relax. Not entertain, not to sleep, but to pray. Everybody say pray. pray. You know, people say you need to take a break and relax. Yes, you need to relax and rest. But I think just as important as it, it is to take retreats, it is equally important to take prayer retreats. Go away for three days. With nothing but your Bible. Just stay in his presence. Maybe take some tapes or, you know, want to, want to listen to something or read something that you're working on in your spirit, man. Just be by yourself with you and God. Even if you did it for one day, it is going to be extremely helpful. Prayer retreats. He said, let's go up to the mountain. He took them up to the mountain to pray. Everybody said to pray. All right? Go ahead. And as, as he what? Something happened. Oh, Jesus. Expect something to happen when you pray. Go with that expectation. See, most often we go to prayer with no expectation, hoping that something may happen sometime later. I'm praying today, but I hope things will happen maybe in a day's time, maybe, you know, a month's time. But we're not going for something to happen now. Listen, he went to pray and something happened. 
You might be going to God in prayer for your healing, but something else might happen. Go with an open heart, open mind, expecting something to happen in your life. Say amen. amen. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. Mm -hmm. Something is happening here. Amen. And his raiment was white and glistening. Oh, Jesus. This impact not only was inside, but now it was so strong, it, was being it began to shine on the outside. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As they were praying, as they did the two days before, as they prayed, as they did the day before, they prayed because Jesus said, wait. And so you're praying, waiting. That's why he said, watch and pray. Or pray and watch. Is that true? That means, what does that connote? That connotes that I, when I'm praying, I'm not praying with a lackadaisical attitude. I'm praying, watching, expecting something to happen in me, upon me, around me, in my situations. So as they prayed, something happened. The Holy Ghost came on them. And it was not just an experience that they felt for themselves. Remember, before this experience happened, before Jesus left to go up, there was a meeting he had with his disciples in, clo uh, in closed doors. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Did he say that? Yes. Come on, talk to me. Did he say that? Receive the, did you see anything happen as an external evidence to that? No. So, but, that, but does that mean nothing happened? Something happened inside them. But now, as they waited on the Lord, something happened with external evidence. Jesus prayed many times, but today he had his disciples with them, a few of them, three of them. And as he prayed, something happened that exhibited itself on the outside, that expressed itself on the outside. Somebody say amen, right? His fashion of countenance changed, altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. Go ahead. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. Wow. It was an encounter for empowerment. Jesus had an encounter for empowerment. Why? Let's go to the next verse. I'll tell you why. And who appeared in glory and spake to, of his disease. So now, Jesus is getting ready to accomplish his destiny. He came to die. He came and he said, I've come to lay down my life. Nobody can kill me. I'm going to lay it down. Now, as much as he knew it, and he knew that that was his destiny and he was going to do it. Listen to me carefully. He was still human. So the human part was struggling. That's why he prayed, Lord, if it's possible, remove this three times. If there's any other way, Lord. The human part was struggling. So God was preparing. So as he prayed, the Moses and Elias come and they begin to talk to him and encourage him. What's he doing? He's being empowered and being encouraged through an encounter. Prayer is a place of encounters. Come on. So as I pray, I need to have an expectant heart. As I pray, I need to look forward to seeing what does the Lord have to say to me? What change is he bringing up? How, you see, watch this. He's preparing him to fulfill his destiny. How many of you know your destiny is not just to get wealthy? How many of you know your destiny is not just to end up in another country? Huh? How many know your destiny is not just to become famous in this world? He said, I will make you rich, famous, and distinguished. I, God will make that. But that's not your 
pursuit in life. He said, if you will do what I tell you to do, I'll take that responsibility. But how do I know what I'm supposed to do in prayer? I might have an inkling. I might have an idea. But I don't know how to do it. And the flesh is fighting me. The flesh does not want me to go that route. So now prayer is helping. In the, in the place of prayer, God is building my character, strengthening my spirit man, and giving me strength to overpower my flesh so that I can stand and I can say, May it be done, Lord God. I am here to fulfill your, my destiny for which I've been born. What is your destiny? Getting a job is not a destiny. Huh? Becoming wealthy is not your destiny. These are all the byproducts as you, uh, that, should, uh, that should manifest in your life as you pursue destiny. And let me tell you, remind you something. The dreams and the visions that God has for each one of us are bigger than what your flesh can ever imagine to do. You will never be able to accomplish this in your own strength. As much as Jesus knew that he came to lay down his life, it was not possible in the natural for him to do it. So God was strengthening him. He sent his apostles. He sent Moses and he sent Elias. And he strengthened. He spoke to, they spoke to Jesus and prepared him mentally, physically, and spiritually to, become re to be ready for what was about to happen. So where, this, where did all this happen? It, was, it happened in the place of prayer. So what is prayer? Prayer is a place of encounters for encouragement. Prayer is a place of finding out and being strengthened in your walk with God to fulfill your destiny. Prayer is not just give me a new sari, a new necklace, a new car. I have to get that, pursue that, pester God, harass God for that new sari. Or that new suit, you know, or the new shoes, you know, those, those whatever, the Jordans or whatever, you know. Uh. Let me tell you, that is the lowest form of prayer. That, that is prayer. I'm, I'm not kidding. That is prayer. But that is the lowest form of prayer. Because your whole mind and heart is fixed on things, not on him. And the moment you get the Jordans, the latest ones, you know, there's something else on the market. <laughs> Move from here to the next one. Oh, no, and now, you know, I've been wearing this particular watch. I need to get that particular watch. How many watches can you wear in your wrist at one time? I'm already struggling. I have an Apple watch in my pocket, so, and I have one over here in my wrist. He said, but wh wh why do you need two? Just to keep count of my steps. <laughs> Not to show off, you know. I'm just saying, listen, hey, life is more than just getting things and, uh, and flaunting your riches and showing off to people. Life is more than that. Thank God for that beautiful, flawless skin you have. That beautiful face. Everybody admires. Everybody wants to be like you, you know. What cream do you use? <laughs> what, what, you know, what products do you use? Hey, I don't, want we, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but I have to let you know that beautiful skin is going to have wrinkles one day. Because let me tell you, whether there are wrinkles or no wrinkles, or the spots or no spots, everything came out of the dirt of the earth. Yes. I'm not saying don't take care of your skin. Please don't misunderstand me. When that becomes your God, it's a problem. Yes. When that becomes the focus of life, that's a problem. Thank God. I mean, some people have beautiful skin and all that is great. And I'm, I appreciate that. I, I appreciate beauty. I appreciate nice things that look nice. But that should never be the pursuit of life. That should not be the focus of life. There is, there is something that is great that God has for every one of you. You have a destiny to fulfill. You have a destiny to fulfill, my friends. 
Glory be to God. Let's go on. And Luke chapter 9, verse 34 to 35, it says, While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. Now listen. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved, son, hear him. Hey, it, the Bible tells us that as he prayed, his raiment changed, his countenance changed. Moses showed up, Elias showed up. They prepared him for what was about to happen. And then God is backing it up. Oh my God, what a powerful time of prayer. God is showing up and God is speaking. This is my beloved son, hear him. All this happened in the time of prayer. Next time you go to prayer, go expecting God to do something in your life. Hallelujah to Jesus. Have an encounter with him. Go with expectation. See, there are too many distractions today in the world. And for effective prayer, you need to, be dis you need to disconnect from all these distractions. That's why Jesus said, go into the closet and shut the door behind. Why? Clutter. There's too much clutter out there. Too much noise. So it's good when everybody is asleep and you're not getting any WhatsApp messages, you know, and you're not getting any phone calls. If that's a problem, throw the phone outside, go into your room, don't touch it until you finish. Because these are distractions. Try, try to get away from all distractions so that you can hear God more clearly and have an encounter with God. The encounter is for empowerment. Somebody say amen. amen. 